Luis became a master gardener late last year, but she's had many, many years creating documentaries for the film industry. And the one that I particularly joined was thrilled to know that she was involved in was recreating Eden, which was a wonderful series of beautiful gardens around the world that uh, were available to us between 2003 and 2008. She will be joined by another master gardener, Marilyn Dudek. Marilyn will be watching <clears throat> for the questions that you are sending through the Q&A and she will organize them and pass them along to our moderator and panelists later in the evening. Now, let's get started with our gardeners here tonight. <clears throat> Elise, please take it. Hello. Um, thank you, Shelley. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening on uh, International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day to all you women out there. Um, this is the first in a series of three chats <clears throat> with the stars of Gardening in the Heart. Tonight, we're talking to Lourdes Still from Masagana Flower Farm and Raymond Garbui from the Rainbow Community Garden. I hope you've been able to watch the episode, uh, both episodes one and two of the series featuring our esteemed guests. If not, the series is available on Five TV Channel One if you are a Bell MTS shareholder, or shareholder, that'd be nice, a subscriber, or it is available on the Manitoba Master Gardener website and YouTube channel. Um, um, if you haven't seen them, I hope you uh, get a chance to see them and enjoy them. <clears throat> Uh, I just want to thank Bell MTS and uh, a, a big thank you to the province of Manitoba Film and Video Tax Credit Program for supporting the series. Also the Manitoba Master Gardener Association for sponsoring the series and this chat uh, series. Uh, and in particular, Lisa Renner, who is behind the curtain tonight, uh, making everything happen. Shelley Walker, who you met, and Marilyn Dudek, who you will meet, uh, who are the executive producers of the series and really helped make it happen. I produced and directed the series with the help of Ivan Hughes, who shot and edited all the episodes. Uh, and I want to thank Justin DeLorme for his music and Judy Graham McKay and Michael and Laura for their guidance in, uh, in doing the filming. Um, now, without delay, I'm very excited to introduce our special guests, Lourdes Still and Raymond Garbui, uh, who will join me now to bring their, their uh, images up. Um, they each bring different perspectives to gardening in Manitoba. Uh, and uh, Lourdes was uh, born in the Philippines. She came to Canada 13 years ago. In 2016, she and her husband, Kevin, decided to turn the lawn on their five acre farm near Richard, Manitoba into flower beds for ecological reasons. But these flower beds have now become the Masagana farm, flower farm and uh, she shares these flowers with the entire province. Uh, Raymond Garbui, Raymond, you can bring your image up now and turn your sound on. <clears throat> was born in Chad, but fled to neighboring Cameroon as a young man, where he lived as a refugee for eight years before coming to Canada in 2005. Now as a CETA, CETA community organizer, he works tirelessly to make other refugees from around the world feel at home in Manitoba. Welcome both to, uh, to Lourdes and to Raymond. Um, and thank you for being with us tonight. This is, uh, I know that you're both very busy. Thank you, Elise. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, so Raymond, I'm gonna start with a question to you. You arrived in Canada in late September in 2005. What did you think when he, winter hit a month later? Was it a bit of a shock? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Liz, and um, everybody here for um, hosting us uh, with, uh, 
my dear friend uh, Yordas. And uh, I, um, I would like to say hi to uh, everybody who is attending here. Uh, we can't see you, but uh, yeah, we say hi to you all. Uh, yes, coming to Winnipeg uh, in the end of September, um, straight from where it's uh, above 40 degrees. <laughs> It was uh, it was kind of shock, but uh, not a surprise because uh, uh, I heard a little bit about uh, Winnipeg before coming here. Uh, to tell you, uh, it's not a joke, but uh, something that happened. Um, the the immigration agent who came to uh, interview us in Cameroon uh, asked me. Uh, suggested me uh, where to go. I had options to go to uh, uh, the US, uh, to Canada, and also to Sweden. And uh, I, I opted to come to Canada. And uh, in Canada, I had the choices to make. Uh, the, the three choices that I had was uh, Quebec City, Montreal, and uh, Winnipeg. And she asked me, I, I said, okay, I will, uh, I asked the particularity of the cities. And she told me that, uh, you know what, I would advise you to go to uh, Montreal because it's a big city and you are a French speaking person. So your integration over there will be easier, but uh, it's up to you to make the choice. Then I said, okay, I already have French, so I have been, I had been um, trying to learn English, but I didn't get that opportunity. So it might be my opportunity to learn English if I can go to Winnipeg. And she said, yeah, that's a good choice, but I have to let you know that uh, over there, it's very, very, very cold. <laughs> and uh, going from where you are now, it will be not easy for you to uh, get adjusted to the cold, to the cold weather. And also the in English will be uh, difficulty uh, another barrier for you in terms of integration. And I, I asked her, yeah. so, so I asked her, if, I asked her uh, are there people, uh, human beings living there? And she said, yes, for sure. And I say, if there are people living there, I will go there too and I will be fine. And then she, she laughed. And that's how I decided finally to come to Winnipeg, uh, which became my home today. So. Uh, reaching the airport here, um, yeah, it, it, of course it is cold, it was cold, but uh, when I reached within the city with uh, uh, help from the person who went to um, welcome me and everything, I got uh, the clothes that were needed, so everything was fine. <laughs> yeah, well, and you had some horticultural training too when you came, right? And were you able to uh, apply that? to, uh, to uh, growing conditions in Manitoba or did you take extra training? Uh, uh, training in, um, did you mean? In horticulture. Uh, horticulture, in, yeah. Yeah. In, yeah, in Chad, um, uh, after my grade uh, 12, um, I, I passed the test to get to the uh, National Institutes for Agronomics. So I went there, I took my, um, uh, my training, I completed uh, my degree there with uh, uh, in local um, um, rural rural development, rural development and uh, local uh, local collectivity management, and uh, with um, a major in cotton production. And uh, when I talk about cotton, I uh, like right behind me here. This is uh, many of you. May I have seen the cotton tree already, but this is uh, the cotton tree. So this is what I got uh, specialized in uh, before I came to, uh, to, to Cameroon. And so the cotton, when you, uh, when you harvest it, that's, this is how we put it, something like this, but big. So we, yeah, that's how we hold it. So in, uh, from Chad, when I completed my education, I started working for, um, um, the largest company, agro uh, industrial company in Chad called the uh, Société Cotonière du Chad. And then 
uh, suddenly things uh, went bad and I had to escape the country and find myself to live as a refugee in Cameroon, as you mentioned earlier. And so that's how in Cameroon also I got uh, the other opportunity through um, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to uh, mm -hmm. go back to, to school and to yeah, take uh, the studies here. Oh. And, but uh, importantly, when I reached here, uh, I got the opportunity also to uh, uh, attend a program called uh, Breaking Ground, uh, Breaking the Ground. And that's um, a program that uh, was uh, funded by the provincial government uh, to allow uh, people who like are internationally trained in agriculture to mm. um, update their skills here. And it was a four month um, yeah, intensive uh, uh, training that uh, I took and that helped a lot. And after that, I got the, uh, another opportunity to go through another four month program called uh, Language Communication for Internationally Educated Agrologists uh, uh, through U of M, University of Manitoba and Success Skills. Uh, so those things uh, were very helpful for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, that's great. And did any of your uh, Afro, have you been able to grow cotton in Manitoba? Cotton in Manitoba? Maybe we will uh, discuss it yes. with uh, my, <laughs> my, my friend uh, Lourdes uh, to see how we yeah. can grow more. <laughs> yeah, because so, I bought some yeah, seeds and I really want to experiment on them. So yes. I want to connect with you and you have to teach me. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Lourdes wants to grow cotton so she can actually grow the cotton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then dye the cotton yeah, exactly. here in Manitoba. Yeah. So let's yeah. see if this works. Right? That would be a great combination. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> okay, now Lourdes, yeah. uh, the Manitoba climate must have been a bit of a shock for you too, because you left uh, the Philippines with your mother yeah. growing orchids on, on uh, her patio. Yeah, uh, her, yeah uh, in her front yard. Yeah, yeah it, it was, um, but, but I moved here late uh, spring. So it was, the shock was not, you know, as soon as Raymond Dick landed in Canada. But I, when I said goodbye to my, my, my boss then, um, I had some heads like, you know, shake on me to like, why am I moving to Winnipeg? Because they said, it, you know, winter gets to minus 40. Um, yeah, but it was a bit of adjustment, especially when I started to dabble into gardening. Um, I did kill a lot of plants from the, you know, last frost date that we still have at the end, you know, after the May long weekend. Um, yeah, and my mom, and I believe that she is on the call uh, today, from, so they're tuning in from the Philippines. Yeah, uh, she, she grew orchids um, and propagated them, and they actually would hang on the fruit trees that, they, that my mom, and that my papa and mama um, planted, I think the first weekend that, you know, we moved to the house where they are in now. Um, yeah, we have, they have some like these small fruit trees and then my mom got into orchid uh, growing because um, Papa, who is, uh, has contract work like outside of, um, of where they're living, so it's south of um, the Philippines, who are known for like growing orchids. Um, yeah, and, and I saw that hanging on the tree branches, um, you know, um, she used this like um, coconut husk as, as a pot and then to hang um, and just like how that multiplied. Um, yeah, but I wasn't, I wouldn't um, consider myself a gardener then. I, I, I saw them, I, um, you know, I watched them um, grow the fruit trees and, and then these orchids, but didn't really think any of it. But I believe that it's, they have a, they are a huge influence to, I don't know, to my love of gardening now. Mm -hmm. And then why did you come to Winnipeg? Why Winnipeg? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, the intention was to practice um, my profession, which is um, I have a degree in nutrition and dietetics. Um, I didn't end up uh, practicing that profession, um, but I don't have very much heartache on, you know, not pursuing that. Um, I think all the things that had um, happened in my life that led me to where I am it has been, you know, I'm very grateful for that. Um, yeah, but also why Winnipeg? Because I had some cousins here who are already living here for a few years and um, I had an option to, you know, um, considering going to the States too, to practice um, my profession, but I think it would just like a lot more make sense because I have family here. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. And yeah. then you had a really interesting job uh, uh, as a buyer for a floor supply 
uh, yeah. company yeah. for six years. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about what you did in that job? Yeah, so I got the job in 2012 and it was an international purchasing coordinator. Um, so the company buys flowers from all over the world. Um, but my account, together with another senior buyer, was buy flowers from South America, specifically Colombia, Ecuador, and uh, Peru, Guatemala. And yeah, yeah, it was uh, it, that work you know we do that day in day out like every week so um we were filling um a semi truck like on a weekly basis um from colombia ecuador to miami and then a truck going up to winnipeg and all the way uh western canada um but yeah but in the it, but it was so interesting during the busiest season which is valentine's or mother's day um so if on a regular week we'll, we're filling up like one semi truck on Valentine's and Mother's Day, that would be like, I think six trucks in a span of like seven, nine days. Wow. wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't think about the volumes, no. right? Yeah. And so did that influence what you're doing today? Yeah, I think working as a buyer at Forest Supply for sure, like influence, I think that was my introduction to the world of flowers. I mean, flowers, um, you know, with my mom uh, growing orchids, so, but you know there is that a little aspect of that and also like growing up as a catholic church like we do you know put together or get some flowers to to um to, to bring to church um but as a consumer you know i think um and also i think do we, um now doing um the flower growing i don't think that i would be doing what i'm doing if uh not for having that job that i held for like six years yeah for sure mm -hmm. And then how did you end up on five acres in Richer, Manitoba? Yeah. Um, so my boyfriend, who is my husband now, um, he already has have, have the property before he met me. And yeah, I didn't really plan on moving to the country. I was a city girl when I was in, in you know in the Philippines and even moving to Canada. I knew my way and I felt really at home in Winnipeg. Um, but also it was a welcome change. Um, yeah, so the first spring, summer that we dated, that we were dating, um, we gardened like right away and it was a um, shared passion. Um, but yeah, but I saw an opportunity that, um, yeah, to maybe um, make that into to a business, which, you know, it was, um, it was a process in the last, I don't know, five, four years. Mm -hmm. for seven okay. years. Yeah. And yeah. we'll talk a bit uh, more about that in a little while. <laughs> Raymond, um, the, community, the Rainbow Community Garden featured in the series is only one of many gardens that you have uh, in the province. Can you tell me where the other gardens are and the numbers of families gardening in those gardens? Uh, yes, there are, um, we do have um, uh, plots um, at uh, St. Mark's uh, Lutheran Church there. They provided us with a spot there. Uh, there are, there are um, a number of families uh, who have been growing uh, vegetables there over the past uh, five, six years. Uh, we do have um floodway side uh, we do have um, Sensital, we do have uh, um uh, neverville um neverville space which is a large space uh, provided us uh, gracious graciously uh, by um the ernest brown family there and that's mm -hmm. very helpful and also there is another site that um, last year through uh, our collaboration with uh, the Winnipeg, uh, uh, the Food Council um, from the Winni uh, city of Winnipeg, we were able to uh, put together a new site in West Kildonan. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so by Perth, there close to the uh, uh, Seven Oaks School Division there by the, yeah, the, the community center there. Uh, we inaugurated it um, last year, and um, of course, our uh, main site, which is the University of uh, Manitoba, with uh, uh, about 258 families last year. Uh, mm -hmm. So, 
that's a lot of have. people yeah mm -hmm. that's uh, yeah. the manitoba but uh, for, for total we we are around uh, 350 uh, families growing in wow. total yeah mm -hmm. and when did you start all of these gardens uh, and when did you get started with and and why why are you doing it and what's important about it uh the garden started in uh, 2008 and um, myself as a uh, uh, newcomer or the uh, new arrival at that time. Uh, it was uh, hard for me to adjust uh, myself to local um, food. Uh, so I, I was trying to, um, to eat like uh, in back home and it wasn't easy. And when I go to the store, I found those uh, food that I used to, but uh, as I it's said expensive. in the film, it's very expensive. And the taste also is not um, quite the same as the one that I, the ones that I used to in Paco. And mm -hmm. I saw the space here. And uh, even though the, the weather uh, can't allow for uh, very long, I think uh, with um, some basic techniques, uh, we can grow something. So that's how I um, approached um, um, Knox Church, uh, Pastor Bill Miller at that time with uh, um, the Knox uh, administration there, I talked to them, and then um, they were open to the idea, and that's how we, we started. And um, uh, after that, uh, thanks to um, one of my good friends, late uh, Terry Lynn, uh, yeah, she brought in some other folks, and also uh, Robert Roll from the St. Norbert Foundation, uh, he came in to help as well, and uh, uh, that's how uh, we went to the University of uh, Manitoba and the university opens their hands, their arms to welcome us. And they started with giving us a small plot to try to see what uh, we were able to do. And finally, after the first growing season, they said, yeah, we can trust you guys so we can collaborate. And that's how we started uh, working together and the university has been very helpful we sign a five-year lease, uh, land use agreement that uh, is renewed um, every five years. And um, with um, a very close collaboration with uh, the Sust uh, Office of Sustainability uh, from University of Manitoba, helping a lot, and also the Department of Architecture and Engineering. I do work very closely with uh, the profs there and their students. And um, overall, there is um, yeah, CEDA, uh, my employer who which um, comes in uh, strongly with the human resources transportation and all this to uh, get this going so far well that's fantastic yeah that's great mm -hmm. um we'll come back and talk a bit more about that mm -hmm. um lourdes uh mm -hmm. tell me uh what uh tinta experience is and and why you started that and how yeah. it works with the garden mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the Tinta experience, if um, for people who watched the uh, short film, so um, the people that were there um, picking those flowers, putting it on fabric, and then, you know, we were unbundling it. So that is um, my Tinta experience. So Tinta experience is a dye your own wearable art experience. It's a three hour engagement at the farm where um, people uh, learn, my guests learn about the multifaceted. Um, operation of the farm. So they learn about the dye plants um, that I grow and how we turn our lawns into garden beds. And there's the you pick experience where um, you pick the flowers yourself, fill um, the basket that I provide you, and then we go back to my outdoor um, space and I show you, I guide you how you can use this to uh, dye um, silk scarves and then and then the other one is like the indigo um, dyeing with the cotton bandana. Um, yeah, so Tinta experience came from, it's a combination of my love on locally grown flowers, so cultivated um, flowers, and also um, my new found passion in natural dyeing. So to tell you a little bit of, of a background on how that came about, um, I can't help but like go back in 2018 when I think we were only growing two plots of garden um, which, which is 20 by 30 so 1200 square feet and there were a lot of flowers so this actually um, the garden in my background that was 2018 so that is when I first um, grow was growing flowers in um, 
in, in this volume. And even though I did sell some, I also did a lot of weddings that I only use um, Manitoba grown flowers. There was a lot of um, waste. So it didn't really sit well with me. And I said, you know, I wanted the flowers to be like multi-purpose. And so the following um, winter, I, I, you know, I was like looking for who are in my neighborhood and neighborhood like in a country uh, standard, which is probably 20 minute drive from where I am, um, that there are these fiber farms who are, you know, raising um, uh, sheep that they use to, um, to spin wool to, for yarn. And that day I learned that they um, cultivate dye gardens to color their yarns. So, that felt like um, this is kind of like the solution to the waste that I saw in my garden in 2018. So now moving forward, you know, um, my flowers are not only one use, but I try to pick the ones, decide the ones that will give me um, two or more um, uses, which is either, you know, good as fresh cut and also as natural dye or fresh cut and also um, as a, a natural dye source. So. 2021, um, that's when I started offering Tinta experience. And I really love showing people like my gardens. And we were like, we were in the middle of pandemic and I saw this opportunity that, you know, we were not able like to travel outside the province and the horticulture scene um, did see an uptake, right? Like um, garden centers like sold out of their plants. So, this need of people to go outside and experience, I guess, the country um, side of Manitoba and get out of the city, I saw the opportunity to um, create this experience. So people, you know, I think it's a three hour engagement at the farm, but also the drive because I'm an hour away from the city. It's like a five hour um, time that you're spending. So I felt like um, it is an offering to Manitobans for like, you know, something new. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of, that, that's how uh, the Tinta experience that came about. Right, that's a, it's a, a good opportunity, yes. So yeah. um, I'm really interested in the indigo dye and, mm -hmm. and can you tell me what plant it is that you grow? Yeah. And uh, tell me a bit about the plant. Is it easy to grow in Manitoba? Is it a perennial? Do you have to start yeah. it indoors or? Yeah. And, so, and how much um, of it do you need? To... Yeah, good question. <clears throat> um, so the variety that I am growing and that we can grow in northern climate is the uh, Japanese indigo or Persicaria tinctoria. Um, mm -hmm. And so I start them indoors, um, like mid-April. Um, that's when I start um, yeah, sowing them indoors and then transplant it as um, for sure, like after the threat of glass frost, because it's very um, frost sensitive. Um, and through, so I don't use the indigo. I don't use for any of my cut flower arrangements. This is mostly this is just for dyeing, and the dye actually comes from the leaves and not on the flowers. Even though it does create, it's that it does have some beautiful pink flowers. Um, and I usually do um, get a couple of like harvest and. Um, so harvesting like the leaves like mid July and then the second one, I let it grow for another six weeks. So I do another harvest in 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 August, and from from that uh, it's a, a not a little bit of science, but it's a lot to do with um, chemistry and science and how to extract the pigment, which and I'm really fast forwarding on this process. Um, and it. Says um, this process of fermentation and then um, watching the make, making the environment of the water where I put the, the leaves, um, you know, watch the pH actually bring it up to alkaline solution. And then there's decanting. So you basically um, putting it, I put it in a mason jar and then I let it separate. So the liquid and then the pigment. And then after that, um, I strain it and then it becomes a paste and, and then. I dry it and it becomes powder. I was able to extract some indigo powder um, from my plants like last year, but I, uh, yeah, but I should tell you that I haven't used it because I just felt it's so precious <laughs> that I think I'm waiting for a really special project um, before I use the um, I use this indigo powder. Um, yeah, so it's not a perennial; it's an annual crop um, in in Manitoba, and I really like it because 
it all it is um, nitrogen fixing too. It's um, in the family of legumes, so I actually use it for crop rotation. Mm -hmm. So that's the another thing that I love about um, indigo. So mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I do plan to uh, rotate it and then just put back um, nutrients back in this, so especially for those ones who are like heavy feeder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how much do you have to grow to to Ooh. get enough to uh, to actually work with? It's really yeah. a, it's a time consuming process, isn't it? It is a time consuming process. It's a very satisfying process. Um, oh, I I I, sh I wish that I brought my jars. Um, not a lot, to be honest. Um, oh. So I do have last year, I do have two 20 feet uh, long bed and three feet wide. And maybe in total of the pigment that I got from them, it's not even 10 grams, I don't think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's a process. Yeah. It, it um, is a process, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to come back to you and talk a bit about marigolds, but I'm going to go to Raymond uh, okay. here. Uh, Raymond, many of the families you work with uh, bring gardening skills and knowledge of plants from, from their home uh, countries. Uh, where they where they use plants quite differently. I was quite surprised when we were doing the filming to see how how uh, the plants that we grow here were being used differently. Like for instance, eating the leaves of the squash plant or the leaves of the bean plant. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? And are there things that we have to know about preparing, for instance, the squash leaves to make them edible, or can you just Pick them and eat them. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry, and yeah, right. yeah, it's um, it's an interesting question, um, and uh, with some curiosity there too. <laughs> I myself, when I um, I start working with um, the families there, uh, I didn't know. I didn't know the way I um, I enriched myself uh, as of today because uh, uh, there there are many leaves and some crops that uh, uh, are there on the land that grow uh, naturally, uh, which are not uh, planted but uh, which are edible, for example. And uh, I did not know about them. It's uh, only when I started uh, yeah, working with um, the families uh, um, at the garden sites. And also uh, something we do is to uh, accompany families at their homes. Uh, when um, the family particip the project participants uh, uh, do have uh, some backyard, for example, then we assist them to uh, produce to uh, oh. develop their backyards and then to produce uh, inside their, uh, within their fence and stuff like that. So that also was um, uh, a learning process for me. And uh, we family, it, so it's a given and receiving, um, it's a meeting of giving and receiving. Uh, I learn from them, they do learn from me and then we do share uh, from different backgrounds. Uh, it, you are talking about um, uh, squash leaves uh, or um, uh, pumpkin leaves. And there are, it's not all pumpkin leaves, but there are some, uh, some varieties that uh, the families do focus on. And those um, varieties, uh, they do use the leaves. Many of them do not grow um, pumpkins for, for the fruit, but uh, mostly for the, the leaves. And um, for my, my, uh, my Nepali uh, family, for example, uh, they talk about Parsi Komunta. Parsi Komunta is uh, uh, the, the, uh, the pumpkin shoot, for example, which is tender. This is what uh, they really like it. And uh, the African uh, folks also uh, go more for the leaves, uh, like the large leaves and stuff, and with little bit of uh, the shoot. And in order for them to eat them, they mostly um, not boil them a lot, but just steam them uh, mm -hmm. to uh, just steam them, and then they, they try to make it tender. And there are some leaves that, uh, because of uh, some substances that they do uh, contain, 
uh, families have to um, boil them a bit and uh, to yeah to remove the the toxicity before they uh, cook and eat it. And usually those leaves uh, they don't they don't uh, boil them a lot, just a little bit to steam them and then they use them. And we have, for example, some um, uh, some it's not weed, but yeah, some weeds that not weed, but um, not weed, uh, like <laughs> something to smoke, but uh, the weeds, we call yeah. them weeds, yeah. Weed too, yeah. So there are some weeds uh, that grow there uh, naturally. And um, here in Canada, uh, can a Canadian born person can see them as, uh, as just weed, and then they get rid of them when they see them uh, on their backyards or something. But over there, I did realize that uh, families know about them. Some of them, they use them as uh, medicinal uh, to cure uh, some wound, uh, to stop uh, um, hemorrhage like bloody uh, situation, or to eat them as vegetable as well. Sometimes they do eat them raw, sometimes they, they cook them. Uh, there is one plant, for example, uh, in Nepali, they call it tepati. And that plant, it's everywhere here. You can just cut it when you get a wound, uh, when you get injured and you are bleeding, you cut it and then you, uh, you rub it on the wound and then it stops and it's like uh, antiseptic, for example. Mm. Uh -huh. And there is. Um, do you know what the uh, Do you know what the local name is for it? Is that a plantain or something? Uh, sorry. Is do you know what the local uh, name for that plant is? Yeah, the local name. Uh, it's. Um, I do have the scientific name. It's. Uh, wait, it will come back. I will. Um, I, okay. Uh, yeah, I will uh, share it with you. And uh, there are some weeds, for example, that. Um, uh, um, Canadian borns uh, do call it um, pigweed. And pigweed, uh, there are two varieties of, uh, there are many varieties of uh, pigweed. And there are some that, um, they are, it's, um, it's actually amaranthus or amaranth. And the wild amaranth, for example, that uh, grows widely everywhere, um, for Canadian born, it's, it's just a weed. And but when um, new immigrant uh, or immigrants see it here, it's a, it's a very good food for them. They harvest it and um, they cook it, they can steam it, they can eat it in soup and all this. And it's very nutritious. And interestingly, that weed back home, uh, we call it um, um, herbe de cochon, like same like pigweed as well. And uh, that's where that's what we go to the bush to harvest them to uh, collect to bring uh, to feed the pigs uh, in back home. So when mm -hmm. I come here, when I came here, I heard the name pigweed. It reminded me straight uh, uh, what we did with it back home, what we do with it uh, in back home. And I saw that um, uh, folks from other part of the, the world are eating it. And the kind, the variety that we do eat back home is the variety that we do grow. And they do look same, but the leaves, you can tell the difference from, difference from the leaves. So when I taste it one time, I found that it was very tasty. And then I started um, eating it as well. And when we went to, when we got um, our uh, plot in Neverville, thanks to um, uh, Principal mm -hmm. Bill Hyun, uh, we got it at um, um, in, in Neverville. We went there, and then that land is full of uh, that pigweed. And so every June, or about end of May, um, about end, uh, beginning of June, middle of uh, June, uh, that's the the first harvest that uh, the families uh, go for there. They harvest it, and then um, there is another. Um, weed as well called um, um, uh, Cinepodium. Uh, Cinepodium, for example, this is uh, for Canadian born. It's uh, it's uh, it's a pure weed, but for new for uh, new immigrants, it's a very very nutritious food, 
And so we go there to harvest it, they go there to harvest it. And uh, so we do that harvest, like the wild harvest first. And then after when we grow the stuff, then we start uh, harvest what we, we grow. Mm -hmm. And so the pigweed, for example, the emerald, the part that we grow is uh, one of uh, uh, the, the crops that uh, we really uh, like here. And another thing that I can add is um, uh, the potato, sweet potato leaves, for example. Uh, sweet potato leaves uh, in back home in Chad, uh, we do grow a lot. We do grow um, sweet potato leaves a lot, but for the roots, not for the leaves. So every time we grow, we remove all the leaves and then we throw them away or we feed uh, animals with, and then we just go for the roots. But when I got here, I did realize that um, some folks from some parts of Africa, like Sierra Leone, um, Kenya, and other places, or um, um, Democratic Republic of Congo, and some folks from um, Asia, they, they do eat it. Yeah, we do. And, and when do I tried it? Yeah. it, I tried it one time, it was so delicious. And <laughs> when I found it out, I, right away, I, I contacted my late uh, mother and I told her, I say, you know what? I ate something here and you can't believe it. She, she asked me what? I said, uh, the sweet potato leaves. Say, really? Did you become an animal there now? I said, no. <laughs> and then I explained to her how to, to cook it. And she told me when she, she made it one time, she didn't uh, let the neighbors know because if they knew it was uh, sweet potato leaf, they would have not eaten. So she didn't tell them and she said that she cooked very well with uh, meat. And then after everybody ate, they start asking, what's this leaf? What did you cook? And then it's at that time that she told them that it was sweet potato leaves. People start saying, what? Are you kidding? And then from there, people start eating sweet potato leaves back home and no one is throwing them because before they have to grow and then to wait until um, uh, about October, they start growing it in June and wait until October and November to harvest the roots. Mm -hmm. So yeah. now when they grow it, they start eating the leaves from July, August, uh, September until the root starts. And uh, so this is something that I discovered here and it was very helpful as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. and there are a number of other plants too that uh, that are um, are being eaten that we consider to be weed, like the mallow. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, that we take out of our garden, especially in the fall or mm -hmm. late summer. Yeah. Yeah, the mallow. Lord, yeah. The mallow Lourdes, this is. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, Lourdes, how do you prepare the sweet potato leaves? Yeah. So, um, so we just blanch it. Um, and then it's really good with the shrimp paste or bagaong. <laughs> and what? um, so it's a shrimp paste. It's like um, it's just like really, really tiny. It's fermented, um, very small like shrimp. And yeah, it, it's very simple, humble meal, but it's um, vitamin rich. Um, so either we'll eat it on its own as, as a side dish for like fried fish um, meal and then you know and and then a, um, a mountain of rice um, or add it into um, a soup yeah so that's how mm -hmm. we, yeah and and my parents would um, would grow them on um, we call it the chicken wire so that would be like the fence and then they'll have it like trailing there um, yeah it's very delicious <laughs> mm -hmm. oh it's really interesting mm -hmm. yeah yeah we throw those leaves away most mm -hmm. of the time and you might know that you mentioned there yeah. uh, Ellie um, like um, our Syrian families, for example, uh, when they when they discovered it, uh, they found that um, it was like a diamond that they found here. <laughs> the yeah, first because day when they're they so it, easy they to harvest, grow too. They harvest, they harvest, they harvest. Yeah. Uh, that's the mallow there. They harvest it a lot, and then uh, they came and they shared it with uh, their uh, community members. And the next day when we were going to Neverville, everybody started following us to go there and to harvest it. And they do it uh, like in salad, they cook it, they steam it, and they do everything with it. And it's, very, it's got very uh, uh, high nutrition and also a sort of curative pro uh, properties, doesn't, doesn't the mellow? 
Yes, it yeah. does. Mm -hmm. It does. It's uh, yeah. it's the same like um, some plants like um, the the jutes, for example, mm -hmm. which is called the muletia, um, muletia, or sometimes they do call it um, saliot mm -hmm. or eodo. These are um, leaves that are very, very uh, nutritious and known for their uh, um, high uh, potential in um, uh, in yeah in um, dealing with um, arthritis or aches, for example. And some some of the the areas where in in developed country in developing countries where or with poor countries where people do have difficulties accessing uh, some medical treatment, for example, or vitamins and stuff. Um, you can see that people do survive and uh, in a good way because they do have access to those kind of uh, leaves that uh, we do neglect here. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, by eating it, um, their bodies are well built and uh, built and uh, it helps a lot. Yeah. So good that um, our families, when they arrive here, they got get the opportunity to go and uh, to access those kind of uh, nutritious food that they can harvest and uh, keep frozen and eat throughout the growing season as through the throughout the winter time as well. Yeah. Right. Good. Um, now, Lourdes, uh, we're going to have to wrap this up soon. But uh, Lourdes, you're coming on to your fourth summer now mm -hmm. in the flower farm. Can you tell me what are some of the struggles that you've encountered and what are the, some of the yeah. successes and then what are you planning for the future? Yeah, so um, easily what nature will bring us like this, um, this growing season, you know, um, that has always been the, the struggle. Um, I find actually that starting from seeds, growing, learning how to grow the, the plants that I'm growing are, is the easy part. Um, the marketing is another, um, an, another, you know, an, another way of running the business. But yeah, but I think it's just like what um, the nature will bring us this year. Um, last year, the drought, and then you know, especially the beginning of June, and then the wind that we get because we're facing a, an open field and we don't have a lot of the um, hedges yet or wind breaks. So that is um, that is very difficult um, in this in the spring, but. Plants are so resilient that sometimes we actually um, give them too little credit um, because yeah, like last year, even though that first uh, week of June uh, with the heat wave that we got, um, I didn't really, I was worrying about like how they will survive, but um, I, I didn't really have to um, re replace a lot of, um, well, I did, but um, yeah, they, they all survived and, 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 you know, and they were good. So yeah, whatever, um, Mother Nature, it, it's always like different like every year. Um, but luckily, too, for the dye plants that I do focus on, they are fairly like low maintenance. So, you know, the marigold that gives me like so much um, range of colors. Um, so yeah, they are very multi-purpose, not only for pest management, but now I do, because I use the dye flowers either fresh or dried. Um, um, so yeah, so the marigold, the scabiosa, which are also like thin cushion, those are very easy um, to grow in, in, in our annual garden. Um, zinnia is also um, a dye plant, actually. Um, there's a certain variety of amaranth, which is hoppy dye, um, which is also edible that I grow and use for, for dyeing. Um, the sunflower, there's a specific variety of sunflower um, and it's called hoppy red sunflower that I'll be growing this year too. And, you know, and, and, the, and the dye comes from the seed. Um, yeah, and the hollyhocks, which is biennial. So yeah, so most of the um, crops that I grow for dyeing are fairly low maintenance, like luckily. Mm -hmm. Are you growing any perennials? This uh, the, the... Yes, um, I do have, a... 20 by 10 plot that were dedicated just for um, for peonies. Um, so the garden this year, um, most of the lawn that we turn into garden beds are 4,800 um, square feet. So um, we still have some pockets of lawns. Um, that's the next project to convert um, this um, green spaces still to be um, native and, and perennial, but um, yeah, so I have my only um, perennials right now are the peonies, which 
is only like second year, so I don't think I'm gonna get a great harvest for them. So hopefully next year on its third year, um, I have some crops of uh, hollyhocks that are, yeah, that are also used for arrangement, but also they are like great as a dye flower as well. Um, yeah, so not a lot of perennials um, right now, but um, it is in, in the works. It is in the plan to, um, um, yeah, to get rid of the rest of our lawns and convert them into perennial native gardens. Mm -hmm. Great. And then Raymond, yeah. uh, what, are, what are the main struggles that you have keeping the gardens going? And, and um, is it financing? Is it uh, interpersonal reactions of, uh, uh, with, between people? Or what, what are the main problems at the garden? Uh, yeah, all of um, whatever you, <laughs> you mentioned here are part mm -hmm. of the struggles. And um, the yeah, transportation for families, uh, tools, uh, supplies, uh, equipment, uh, small equipment, and even um, space access. Uh, we are landless farmers, and that's uh, one of the challenges that uh, we have been facing. And uh, so water, for example, was uh, one of uh, the major challenges. And uh, thanks to um, uh, some great partners, uh, uh, including University of Manitoba, CETA, and uh, um, with help from the provincial government, uh, different uh, organizations were able to help with uh, uh, getting water to the edge of the, of the garden and then the extension from the edge of the garden to the middle and to the, the middle east, west, and the south of uh, the garden. Uh, which has been very helpful. And um, things became even uh, more complicated with uh, the COVID-19 uh, situation because uh, before families were able to share hoses, to share end tools, uh, to share shade and stuff. But uh, uh, with uh, the shifts that we, we had to deal with now, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to share um, whatever is here in place, which is uh, difficult. And there used to be uh, some organizations uh, like um, um, Asimi Union and uh, uh, Winnipeg Foundation, they used to help with uh, um, the supplies, with some small tools and stuff uh, through uh, Knox United Church, because Knox uh, plays um, a very important fiduciary uh, role in this uh, uh, project. And that's how uh, we have been um, keeping on. And the, um, like the technical part, uh, like um, from the university, the land, and um, uh, all you can name all kinds of uh, support that the University of Manitoba is uh, giving, which is great. And in terms of human resources, that's uh, imagine this huge project uh, uh, running on voluntary basis without um, any um, help. <laughs> Stuff. Um, the human resource that is there is myself uh, through CIDA. And uh, this is not uh, all that uh, I do on behalf of CIDA. I do have other projects, other uh, activities that I do, mm. which are very important as well. So all this uh, comes back to the financial and um, to uh, any kinds of support that uh, is uh, missing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're a busy guy. Yeah. So um, I just want to uh, uh, let the participants out there uh, know that uh, if you have any questions, type them into the question uh, part of the, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, the Q&A, type your questions in there. And uh, we still have a few minutes left. Um, we were going to close this off at about an hour, but if you've got any questions that you want to ask, uh, just give them to us now and Marilyn will come in and, um, and relay those questions to us. Um, I just want to know, uh, Lourdes, mm -hmm. how, how do people get in touch with you? And yep. if uh, people want to talk to you about dyeing uh, fabric or, yeah. or, or uh, growing flowers, is there a place yep. where they can reach you? 
Yeah, so my website is www.masaganaflowerfarm.com. Um, so, and also they can email me at hello at masaganaflowerfarm.com. This month, I do have um, seeds starting uh, online workshop through Manitoba Craft Council and also through uh, Longway Homestead. Um, the Longway Homestead actually it's a, um, a hands-on uh, seed starting workshop. So, um, yeah, if people wanted to uh, learn how do I start my flowers, and actually this office that I'm in, well, the background is my garden, but the, where my, my office is is actually where my um, uh, my rack where I have my seed starting um, set up. So um, yeah, so I'm gonna share um, how I start everything from seeds in that um, workshop. So mid, I think, I forgot the dates, but um, if you look up on Manitoba Craft Council, um, people just have to tune in into the YouTube channel that we they will have on. But the Long Way Home said that one for sure is on March 26. That's a hands-on one. If you go to a uh, long way homestead um website under field school um they will see more information on that i also i am also a heavy user on instagram so i do um send out reminders in there if people are interested to see what um what i'm all about like this um um this year and yeah and they can visit my website um if they wanted to get in touch with me or or email me at hello at messaganaflowerfarm.com Okay, that's great, great. And then, and then, um, Raymond, if you, how do people get in touch with you if they want to volunteer or if they've got tools that they want to donate or? Uh, yes, uh, like uh, if a physical contact would be uh, would be good through um, see the office at uh, um, yes in at Selker in the north end. And also, uh, CIDA stands for Community Education Development Association. So it's uh, at um, uh, CIDA is located uh, within the um, uh, Merchant Corner there uh, in North End on Selkirk. And uh, yeah, and another place is uh, Knox uh, Church uh, at, in Central Park at Knox United Church there, right across Central Park. It's uh, 400 Edmonton there. And um, for my contact, uh, it's uh, Raymond, uh, Raymond, uh, so Raymond, R-A-Y-M-O-N-D, uh, at CEDA, C-E-D-A-W-P-G dot org. And that's where they can uh, contact me or um, I can be reached at 204-509-6259. Uh, or we can, five eight two yeah or through Knox Church or Sida yeah we can. yeah we can we can put that information on on the uh, Manitoba Master mm -hmm. Gardeners website mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so if people want to refer to it yeah. so I'm going to uh, I notice that there are questions now I'm going to uh, ask Marilyn Dudek to come in to join us and uh, and read out some of the questions that have been uh, that have been asked. Hi, <laughs> hi, hi, Elise and Lourdes and Raymond. It's been fabulous. I mean, we learn so much. Um, Wendy asks a question, and I think some of it has been answered. It, but uh, she writes, "I would like to know about the squash or pumpkin leaves that are edible, and are they specific types of squash? And if so, what kind? Also, the bean leaves that the lady from Burundi eats. How are they prepared?" And are they only specific types of beans? So a couple of questions, both the types of squash and the types of uh, green beans. Um, yeah, those are great questions. In, in terms of uh, types of, um, of squashes or pumpkins, I think um, there are uh, plenty of varieties, but um, the characteristic that I notice is that uh, the families, like uh, most families, they do eat the ones that have like um, um, big stems, uh, not stems, but uh, yeah, stem, we can say stem. And uh, vines, should, yeah. Yeah, the vines that are, are big, that's what they, they do like. And the only, the, the kind, the, the type that they do not, um, uh, the, time, the, the type of leaves that they do not uh, eat are mostly um, the yellow, the yellow 
pumpkins, for example, which are more uh, mostly for the for decoration, for the Halloween decoration, and yeah, those kinds. But any kind of um, pumpkin that um, uh, is sweet and that the um, the fruit can be eaten, they go for the le the leaves. And there are some that uh, uh, we do imported here. Imported means. Uh, through the University of Manitoba, for example, they have been out there. They help us with uh, some exotic uh, plants, some different types of uh, uh, pumpkins. Those are the kinds that uh, yeah, we do usually go for um, the leaves to be eaten. And uh, the beans, it's the same. Uh, the families do not eat the leaves, like the regular beans, like the green beans, for example, that we do have here. Um, they do not eat those leaves. Uh, the ones that they do eat the leaves are uh, the, like the black eyed peas, for example, these are types of the leaves that they do eat. There are type of beans that are, um, are red kind of and uh, are reddish and uh, the leaves are um, with, uh, the leaves are, do have some, spe some special type of leaves uh, of shape, and these are the ones that I see them uh, mostly eat them. And also, um, Lourdes mentioned um, uh, the, the fixing the, the nit nitrogen on the ground. So there are some types of um, of uh, beans like uh, Cotalaria or Alupodgonium. I don't know how to call them in uh, in English, but uh, those are the types of uh, uh, the beans that uh, families do usually eat them. And before they steam them or they, uh, they cook them in soup, they boil them a little bit. They don't boil them, but they, they boil water. They bring water to boiling and then they add to it and they sit for um, a while and then they remove right away before they uh, use it. And the other, the other um, name that I was... Um, um, looking for is artisma the the, oh, yeah. the plant that i was artisma anua that yeah this is uh, the what i was mentioning and that's also is uh, used uh, in back home in africa to cure malaria no to yeah to cure malaria and stuff too yeah. artemisia mm -hmm. uh, comes in variety and and is a weed here or it can be used in in gardens as a decorative uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that fascinating about all the varieties of weeds that we classify. Um, here's another uh, from Hila. Do you need gardening tools? Yeah, that's um, one of the most needed um, um, things. Um, families really do need uh, tools. So any tools can go through the University of Manitoba um, Sustainability Office or through uh, Knox Church or through Cedar. And uh, yeah, but sometimes um, Food Matters Manitoba also can um, receive those things and then uh, convey them to us as well. And Food Matters Manitoba has been playing a huge role in what we do too. Yes, and I know one of our members is collecting them from the Master Gardener members. So I'm sure she'd be willing to uh, have people drop it off at her place. I can always uh, give more information for that on the website. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And yeah, we, we have been receiving um, seedling donations, um, used tools from the uh, Master Manitoba Master Gardeners. Uh, yeah, your support has been really, really appreciated lately. Uh, thank you very much. Our, uh, several of our members are growing peppers for uh, the garden at the university. because. Uh, was a popular crop there when I visited when, uh, during the filming. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth uh, asks Lourdes, this question's for you, what kind of soil do you have? Is a rocky soil a thing? <laughs> because we're finding when, we when we're turning our lawns, um, yeah, oh my gosh, we would like get big um, rocks, um, but mostly clay, um, clay and sand. Um, in our area. We are at the bottom of the hill, um, our, our property. Um, yeah, but um, clay for sure. 
And do you, this is going to be a question for me, how do you amend it or do you amend it? Yeah, uh, my amendment, especially this past year, we have um, a lot of like new um, garden beds. Um, we had used, you know what, sprinkle um, compost, like a, a, we have um, a, a we have a company that's like very near to us, so that's where we we get our uh, very well aged um, um, compost. That is all really the amendments that I've done. Um, and then I do, um, and then the crop rotation I find that it's like really help. Um, and yeah, and like I said, um, the plants that I grow they don't really have a lot of um, they're very low maintenance. So I find that as long as I just sprinkle them with um, a good compost, if they are like new beds, um, that's all really that it needed. Okay, we were discussing growing cotton. I know you have the seed. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. we have the uh, professional uh, cotton grower in Raymond. Raymond, yes. how would you recommend to Lourdes to begin growing her cotton crop? Interesting. I think uh, uh, the first thing to do is to look for a variety that uh, uh, is uh, that goes the short, uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, because, zone? Uh, no, short maturity. Yeah, short maturity, <laughs> maturity. Sure, I don't variety. think there is. <laughs> so, uh, and in, um, for that, uh, since we can't uh, import the seeds here um, uh, without going through the official uh, channel, we would um, go through the University of Manitoba or some um, um, official uh, seed companies here and see if they can uh, provide us with uh, the short... Uh, short season. Short season. Yeah, I know it is a <laughs> long is, shot. Yeah, yeah uh -huh. it is a long and, shot. Yeah, once we get that, um, we can, even though if we do not get uh, the short uh, maturity uh, variety, we can still go for the long variety, but uh, uh, we will apply some basic techniques uh, in terms of uh, what kind of soil to have around uh, the plants, when to put them down, maybe we can uh, pre-germinate the, yeah. uh, the seeds. And then uh, maybe we, we need to cover them and give them some, um, temperature, uh, some range of temperature uh, when the, the weather or the climate fluctuates and something like that. Mm -hmm. That way, maybe we can hope getting, even if it's not to the maturity, we can get uh, uh, to a situation where we can find something like this if it's not completely open, but maybe if we can have it like this, it will be already something. Yeah. <laughs> It's so over. interesting because the seeds already look like cotton. It's like really fuzzy. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Fuzzy seeds. And, um, yeah. And also we do have our um, good friends at uh, University of Manitoba in the greenhouse, for example, who has, have been helping a lot with um, uh, some varieties like this. So we can talk to them and maybe start growing them from uh, the greenhouse. In, in indoor, you can talk to Joanne, for example, mm -hmm. if she can help with the starting it uh, indoor and then see if we can um, find a way of um, uh, succeeding the transplantation from indoor to outside so that uh, we can make it successful. Yeah. What's the normal maturity for a cotton plant from growing to harvest? Uh, it's, uh, it can do six months could be uh, five months, it depends. And it depends also uh, on the type of the soil and the weather, the temperature. Yes. Because, yeah, uh, yeah it's, it requires a uh, hot temperature. Yes, well, I, I know when we spent the winter in Arizona that uh, there'd be fields of it there and, and you would see them planting it in the fall and, and it would take quite a while to, uh, mm -hmm before it matured to harvest rate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I look forward to that experiment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's go for it. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, Ursula says, no question, just 
Lourdes. Thanks, Lourdes and Raymond. I had the pleasure of watching your Gardening in the Heart episodes, and it's a pleasure to hear from you. You're both very inspiring, and I love the contributions you're making to the community. Elise, you know I love you. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's uh... <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for having us um, yeah, in the short mm -hmm. yeah. And that's all the questions I have uh, here at this time. Is, is there anything that uh, either of you want to say to close off this session, Lourdes or Raymond? Yeah, um, I really want to invite um, people to check out the website and yeah the tinta experience i'm going to relaunch it like this year and we'll start booking in may um yeah there are some like video teaser in there um i don't do um dye um classes but um through my tinta dye on wearable like, art experiences where you can um experience this like plant magic from like most common flowers that we can actually like grow in manitoba yeah so check that out and i'm really looking forward to um welcoming um, yeah, my fulfillments in my garden um, this coming summer. Good, yeah, it's lots of fun out there. <laughs> and Raymond, do you have anything you want to say? Yeah, I would. Um, I would like to thank uh, everybody for their time, for taking their time to listen to us, um, and also for the interest that they uh, they do express in uh, what uh, we we do in our community. And I would like to catch uh, this opportunity to express uh, uh, on behalf of uh, all families involved in uh, Rainbow Community Gardens, uh, our gratitude <coughs> to uh, some key partners, uh, organizations and individuals uh, without uh, whom this uh, project can survive or can continue, uh, starting with uh, the University of Manitoba and their uh, Office of Sustainability. Um, uh, Food Matters Manitoba, uh, Knox Church, uh, St. Ma uh, Mark's um, Lutheran. Uh, we do have the Manitoba Food Council from the city of Winnipeg and um, uh, Gordon Bell High School with uh, their um, principal, Mr. Bin Shun, who knows, who understands that uh, uh, any student with as, uh, empty stomach cannot listen or cannot uh, perform in class and who has been behind this project as um, uh, an important uh, uh, contributor. And um, uh, also I can't forget um, uh, Ernest uh, Brown family and uh, mom Doreen in Neverville, uh, Peter Nickel in, um, in Landmark and also uh, Janet uh, Civili from the city of Winnipeg, all these people, and there are some that uh, I don't uh, mention here, like uh, the Winnipeg Foundation, which in the past uh, helped mm -hmm. families with uh, bus tickets, uh, uh, supplies, and all this. So thank you everybody for uh, your contribution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and thank you, Lourdes and, and Raymond for your contribution here tonight. And I'll turn it back to, uh, to Shelley. Okay, and thank you, Elise, Lourdes, and Raymond for sharing your thoughts and experiences with us. I found it uh, actually really enlightening. There's a couple things I want to try in my garden this summer. I want to apologize to those people who did not uh, were not able to get their questions answered because unfortunately we've run out of time. However, thank you, all of you in the audience for joining us and for your questions tonight. If you, if, if you had a question that didn't get answered, or if you think of something that uh, after you sign out, you can go to our website at uh, www.mgmanitoba.com and look for the ask at picture on this, the right hand side of the page and leave your question there and it will be referred to either one of our panelists or to somebody else who could answer your question. You, uh, as the audience, will.